Hello everyone and welcome back to Bugs and Biology. Now a few of you may know that I fairly recently went on a trip up to Heron Island, which is located in the southern Great Barrier Reef. And I had a great time there. It's an amazing place, not least due to the fact that there are more centipedes there than anywhere else I've ever been. Well, apart from this room, but yeah, otherwise the most centipedes I've seen in one area. So all in all, it was a great trip and I enjoyed pretty much every moment of it. The trip, however, was not a holiday, although it certainly felt like it at times, but a field trip for university, during which we were to conduct experiments concerning an aspect of a particular marine organism's ecology, the results of which would form the basis of an assignment later in the semester. Myself and a group of my peers were investigating an intriguing group of animals called the sea hares. These are gastropod mollusks that form a clade called the Anaspidia, and their colloquial name comes from the prominent sensory tentacles on the animal's heads, which resemble the ears of a hare. At first glance, they appear to be completely soft-bodied, but you'd probably soon realise that conclusion was mistaken if you were to pick one up, as a feel of the animal's back would quickly reveal something hard beneath its skin. This is the vestige of the sea hare's shell, which has been reduced to the point of being internalised, alike to that of a cuttlefish, rendering it unable to be seen from the exterior in most cases. Sea hares are found in marine ecosystems worldwide, predominantly shallow coastal regions in tropical and temperate waters, most are small to moderately sized animals, but some species can attain monumental proportions. A plesia vaccaria, which occurs off the coast of North America, can reach lengths of almost a metre, making it arguably the largest gastropod mollusk known. Sea hares are benthic animals, meaning they dwell on the seabed, and primarily locomote via contractions of their large muscular foot, that being said, they are capable of swimming, if you can call it that, which they do by flapping a pair of wing-like protrusions called parapodia. Their manner of swimming is vaguely reminiscent of that of a squid or stingray, albeit carried out with the grace and elegance of a funnel-web spider trying to climb. Although to be fair, I'm basically the last person who should be criticising anyone or anything's swimming ability, I stick to running for a reason. Two species of sea hare can be found on the reef that surrounds Heron Island, though that number may very well soon rise to three, due to a very special find that I'll be covering towards the end of this video. Am I trying to get you to wait till the end to improve my viewer retention? No, I would never be so... smart. Anyway, we will start by looking at what is probably the most common of Heron Island's sea hares, Aplesia argus. Aplesia argus is a species with which I have been familiar for several years, as it is fairly abundant in rock pools and other intertidal habitats along pretty much the entire eastern coast of Australia, and I would see them fairly regularly when I visited places like Malulaba. For the most part, Aplesia argus is a moderately sized species that typically doesn't surpass 25 centimetres in length, although some individuals can get much larger, which is likely affected by availability of food. This species is sometimes confused with the closely related Aplesia dactylomella, which is almost identical in appearance. Indeed, they were once considered to be one and the same although genetic evidence has since revealed that populations from the Atlantic region and the Indo-Pacific were distinctive enough to be regarded as two separate species, with Aplesia dactylomella being confined to the former location and Aplesia argus the latter. Aplesia argus seems to be fairly diurnal in terms of habit, and we observed many individuals out and about in broad daylight and yet somehow finding them never ceased to be exciting, with the 20th specimen of the day being every bit as big of a deal as the first. Their coloration is affected somewhat by the algae upon which they feed, 
allowing the animals to effectively blend in with whatever species they predominantly graze upon. This, combined with their disruptive patterning, a form of camouflage where an animal's outline is broken up so that its shape becomes difficult to discern, made the sea hares fairly tricky to spot in spite of their abundance. Like all sea hares, a plesia argus can, when sufficiently provoked, release ink into the water as a deterrent against predators, the coloration of which depends on the pigments within the algae that the animals consume. The ink is not only toxic, but can adversely affect a predator's olfactory senses, dampening its ability to detect its target via smell. A plesia argus, however, wasn't what my group had come there to study. It was merely a species we'd see a lot of whenever we ventured out onto the reef flats. We were at Heron Island to investigate a much more cryptic and consequently lesser known species, Dolabella auricularia. Dolabella auricularia is a lot more difficult to find than Aplesia argus. While the latter can often be seen during the day, the former is strictly nocturnal and spends the day submerged beneath the sand. So the only way to stand a decent chance of locating some is to head out onto the reef at night. That being said, we were fortunate enough to encounter a lone individual that was out in daylight. Though such a find was almost certainly an anomaly. As you may be able to tell from the footage, Dolabella auricularia tends to be significantly larger than Aplesia argus, sometimes reaching around 40 centimetres in length. And there's some other prominent differences too. Dolabella also has a distinctively flattened rear end, almost as if it had been spanked a few too many times. And its patterning is even more cryptic than that of Aplesia, so in spite of its larger size, it is often even more difficult to notice. Dolabella auricularia is currently the only described species in its genus, unless you count the extinct Dolabella aldrichai from the early Miocene epoch. However, as I mentioned before, there may soon be another species described. The sea hare also has a rather strange relationship with a fish called Carapus morlani, commonly known as the pearl fish. This elongate, eel-like creature has taken the phrase pain in the ass to an entirely new level, living inside various invertebrate hosts, which they enter and exit via the anus. This is a form of symbiotic relationship known as commensalism, where one organism benefits, in this case the fish gaining a shelter, and the other, in this case the sea hare, is largely unaffected, receiving no significant benefits nor drawbacks from the arrangement. I'd also like to clarify the meaning of symbiotic here, as many people seem to misuse it as a synonym for a mutually beneficial relationship. Symbiosis merely refers to any long-term arrangement where two different organisms live in very close proximity. Aside from that, it doesn't imply anything about whether said relationship is positive, negative or neutral for one or both parties involved. So now it's time to talk about what we were actually studying. We were at Heron to investigate the species feeding preferences, which are comparatively understudied when compared to some other sea hare species. However, from the admittedly rather limited research that has already been conducted, it can be gathered that Dolabella is more of a generalist feeder, grazing on a variety of different algae, and evidence even exists that individuals of the species actively try to add variety to their diets, which has benefits for their growth. We wanted to identify any trends in their feeding. How much algae do they eat? What species? And of those, what do they prefer? Now, I am not going to go super in depth with the experimental methods. At the end of the day, this is a YouTube video, not a lab report. So I'm just going to give a basic outline. That being said, if there's anything you want me to elaborate on, then let me know in the comments and I'll be happy to fill you in. Prior to our arrival at the island and the commencement of our investigation, Eight Dolabella were collected from Heron Reef 
and kept individually in separate tanks of equal dimension. Three additional tanks were kept empty. I'll get into the reason for that later. In each tank, including the empty ones, we would place a zip tie that had eight different species of algae affixed along its length in a random order. These being, oh boy, all right. Chlorodesmus fastigiata, Laurentia intricata, Pedina melamele, Hydroclathrus clathratus, Colopa cupressoides, Colpaminia sinuosa, Halamida cylindresia, and Halamida macroloba. Yeah, so that's my new rap song. Hopefully it's going to be a commercial success, I'm pretty confident. Anyway, moving on. We would leave these in overnight while the sea hares were active, but would get up at three hour intervals to replace any algae if the species had been entirely devoured. The following morning we would record the overall volume consumed for each species of alga. But sometimes the algae could be lost for other reasons. Many species were fairly brittle, with fragments being easily dislodged. So how did we account for the loss of algae via random means unrelated to sea hare grazing? Well, that's where the empty tanks came in. These served as the experimental controls and gave us an indication of how much the volume of the algae can change without any influence from the sea hares. During the day, we would temporarily pair up the sea hares so that two animals shared an individual tank. This was because sea hares appear to be fairly social animals, so facilitation of interaction with conspecifics was considered a potential means to encourage more natural behaviour, and therefore more useful results. We called this period playtime, although the sea hares had something else in mind. I already mentioned how they have four horn-like projections on their head, but they are horny in more ways than that. Let's just say playtime would often rapidly escalate into playboy time. Our data showed evidence of very obvious preferences. Soft, fleshy algae such as Hydroclathrus clathratus, Colpaminia sinuosa, and above all, Laurentia intricata, were overwhelmingly favoured over tough, calcified types like the two Halamida species which showed no evidence of consumption whatsoever. These results did align with prior research concerning the species, as it had already been established that physical defences such as calcification were a major determinant of Dolabella feeding preferences. So why were we studying this, you may ask? Well, aside from the fact that sea hares are cute as heck, their potential role in reef ecosystems is definitely something worth investigating. The macroalgae upon which sea hares feed are major competitors with corals. Corals, especially the reef-building stony skeleton species from the order Sclerotinia, gain a significant portion of their nourishment from photosynthetic single-celled algae, namely those of the genus Symbiodinium, informally known as Zooxanthellae that live within the coral's tissues. This close dependence on photosynthesis means sclerotinians are reliant on light, hence their prevalence in clear, shallow, sunlit waters. Macroalgae often grow on and around corals, and unlike coral colonies which have slow, sometimes glacial growth rates, many macroalgae can spread extremely rapidly, and if left unchecked, can smother vast areas of coral depriving the symbiodinium of the light required to undergo photosynthesis. Now, sea hares are capable of consuming immense quantities of algae, and the soft, fleshy species that they almost unanimously prefer are also the ones that tend to grow the fastest and thus provide the most intense competition for corals. Sea hares also grow and breed rapidly meaning populations of the animals would likely be able to respond quickly to a bloom in algae, and with nutrient runoff from the land further fueling abnormal proliferation of macroalgae, the potential magnitude of the sea hare's role in regulating their spread is something that cannot be left uninvestigated. After the experiment was finished, we released the eight sea hares back onto the reef 
and it was truly remarkable to see just how quickly such a large animal could completely vanish in plain sight thanks to their near impeccable camouflage. Now with the bulk of this video over, it's time to go back to that potential new species I mentioned a couple times already. While none were found over the course of my visit, several Dolabella specimens had been seen on Heron Reef that were markedly different from the familiar Dolabella auricularia, and suspected to be of a hitherto unknown species. And even though I didn't get the joy of seeing one in the wild, there was an individual being temporarily held at the research facility, and a quick glance was more than enough for me to see why it was believed to be a species new to science. Compared to Dolabella auricularia, which itself is a fairly sizeable mollusk, this species is huge. Even when contracted, the animal in the tank was about as long as my forearm, and what's more, the individual being kept at the facility was, apparently, a rather small specimen for the species. The size of the animal was certainly the most obvious difference, but it wasn't the only feature. This Dolabella species is very heavily tasseled, with innumerable small branching structures protruding from its body, giving the animal the appearance of an algae-covered rock. Its camouflage was, if anything, even more effective than that of Dolabella auricularia, which is itself something you might still fail to notice even if five people were shouting at you while pointing at one. The sea hare also laid an egg mass while in captivity allowing us to investigate the species' embryology. And it was found that the species' eggs differed from those of Dolabella auricularia, further supporting the notion that this species is indeed new to science. Alright, and that is the end of this video. Now of course there's plenty more to be learned about sea hares, but hopefully the research we contributed to will provide a more solid foundation. Now, admittedly, the content of today's video is quite different from what is usual on this channel. Um, to make up for that, at least here's my big type of stall of Arbata. And that's kind of the problem with branching out on YouTube. On one hand, if you don't branch out enough, your content is kind of doomed to become really repetitive and boring quite quickly. But on the other hand, if you branch out too much, your channel just loses any sort of theme or identity. So it's all about staying on that middle line, and let me know what you thought about this video. Was it too far removed from my usual content type, or would you like to see more marine life related videos? Because I filmed a lot, look at her resting, I filmed a lot more stuff at Heron Island than just the sea hares. So that is basically it, excuse me, okay. Now if you enjoyed my content then of course feel free to check out some of my other uploads and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, that is it from me, and I shall see you again very soon.